Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father and Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text comes to us from Psalm 22, read a moment ago, and our theme verse will be that last verse, verse 11, which reads once again, Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Here ends our text. Now, when I was a child, there's one memory I have, probably late elementary age or so. And My sister, who was two years younger than I, she still is two years younger than I, the two of us were uh, playing at a friend's house who lived a street behind us. As the evening became greater and greater, our friend had to go inside to eat dinner with his family. So my sister and I uh, went with another friend who was there to his house, which was the next street over, and played with him until he had to go inside. Then we went back to that first friend's house to play some more. It wasn't until it started to get dark that we decided to go home, walked back to our house, only to find the front door was completely locked, the lights were off, and there was nobody stirring inside. We rang the doorbell, there was no response from our parents, couldn't even see the dog moving around. My sister and I getting a little nervous, we started walking around the house and checked all the windows, checked all the doors, everything was locked, there wasn't a, any movement, we couldn't find anyone around. So we sat on the front porch, kind of nervous, confused, wondering, where is everyone? After a couple minutes of sitting there, my parents opened the door and out they walked. So they were trying to teach us a lesson about the importance of communication they were trying to show us how nervous they were because we weren't talking to them or communicating where we were. And so as they were left wondering throughout the evening, where are they, my sister and I, they wanted to show us what it's like to ask the question, where are they, this time being mom and dad. Where are they? That's... It's a tough question sometimes, especially when we're expecting somebody to be right there in a time of need or in a time of help. It's what David is asking throughout Psalm 22. Where are they? In particular, in this case, where is God? Psalm 22, a text that Jesus quotes from the cross. As we began reading it in verse 1, we hear those famous words being proclaimed. In fact, if we look at the gospel passion narrative of all three, or excuse me, of all four gospels, we'll see there's 13 different places within just that passion section uh, that refer to Old Testament quotes. So 13 Old Testament references. Of those 13, eight of which are found in the Psalms, and of those eight, five are within Psalm 22 itself. So if you want to look for one place of the Old Testament that is most, uh, most used in the Gospel Passion, it's Psalm 22. And the Psalms, of course, those serve as the Old Testament hymn book, the, the hymnal that describes and tells us what worship was like for the people of God way back in the Old Testament. It describes their relationship with God what it was like for them to call out and how they called out to him in their times of need and in their times of celebration. Psalm 22 describes a, a lament, a, an individual's lament, an individual who is crying out in a time of need. And we heard that in verse 11. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and, none, and there is none to help. Or maybe it's, it's even better expressed in our first verse. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? David, as he begins this psalm, Psalm 22, he's not hiding reality. He's not beating around the bush. He's not uh, foreshadowing with something simple. He gets right to the point immediately. Where are you, God? What is going on right here? He describes the problem completely and in fact, he's, he's asking, he's warning, he's confused. What is going on? And really, the problem that David is describing, God has been warning about from the beginning. If you've been reading the Bible with us throughout this year, you know we're near the end of Deuteronomy at this point. And, and Deuteronomy, as it gets to the end, as Moses is giving these final instructions and final words to the people of Israel, uh, he gives them this warning. Deuteronomy 28, if 
He says, if, if Israel does not obey the voice of God, does not listen to the commandments and statutes of God, if they go their own way, if they forsake what God has said, well, then God will be, bring destruction and curses upon them. And here's the quote. Because you have forsaken me. I mean, that's similar to what Joshua even says near the end of his book. Decide this day whom you will serve. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. David, he's crying out and he's acknowledging the reality of sin. He's acknowledging that even though Moses warned the people of Israel, if you forsake God, he will forsake you. David knows that. He recognizes the division and the separation has already come, that the reality of that separation from us and God is heavy upon him as he's crying out, where are you right now? And really, it's a separation that we see all too often today. I mean, that's the heart of Good Friday, isn't it? The temple curtain being torn in two. The fact that Jesus and the Father are now being separated as, the, as Jesus cries out, Why have you forsaken me? And we see that. The reality of sin and how it separates us from God as well. The point that we're left asking that same question, Where is God today? Now we're, we're approaching the end of the season of Lent. Remember, it's been almost 40 days now that we've been in this season with the purple on the altar. And uh, for some people, it involves uh, giving something up or, or taking something on as a way of preparation for Easter to come. If you did that, how, how are you doing? Were you able to stick with it? Are, are you still sticking with it? I was talking to a, a youth on Wednesday at the a uh, meal, the meal before service, and he said he gave up chocolate for Lent, and so far he's only slipped once. He had one chocolate chip cookie, and he was eating it before he realized what was going on. I said, That's impressive for, for a kid to, to only have one little piece of chocolate in those 40 days. What about you? How, how are you doing with that? Or, I mean, you could even take it all the way back to, uh, what, New Year's resolutions. If you make those, you're keeping with it. See, we have a nature, a human tendency to really anything we begin to eventually forsake it, to, to give it up, to abandon our best of attempts. We may try to read the Bible in a year or continue with some regular devotional life, but it gets hard and sometimes it's easier just to give up at times. Well, sure, we've got good goals. We've got our best of efforts, but we always fall short. And that's our our nature is to break promises, promises to ourselves, promises to others, and promises to God. And try as we might, we're always going to fall short of something. Deuteronomy 28, though, as it warns about forsaking God's commandments, he's not talking about making minor goals and keeping minor goals. Deuteronomy 28 is talking about life and death. And at a time where it appears like God is the one who is abandoning us, He is forsaking us and leaving us to the point that we cry out, Where are you, God? We first need to acknowledge that it's not He that abandons us, but us that abandons Him. That we're the one that walks away from Him in our sin. It may appear that God is abandoning and forsaking us, but really, the troubles and the pains that we have this day, well, it's because of the temptation that we give into. And it comes around far too often, for the reality is our sin does create division. As God doesn't abandon us, our sins are the ones that do it. And so we're left crying out the same words that David has. Verse 11, once again, Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no to help. We know the reason David cries out. He's calling out to God for that help. He's calling out to God because God is a God. He's he's proven himself to be one who helps his people who are in the midst of that forsaken state. 
That's why in verses 4 and 5 that we read earlier, David says this in the middle of his lament and his complaint. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were rescued. And in you they trusted and were not put to shame. Now we know the story of Israel in the Old Testament. They were eventually forsaken and sent to Egypt and forsaken and sent to Assyria and to Babylon. And in each of those cases, God had mercy on them, reached out to them and brought them back to himself. And so our only hope on this Good Friday is that God would act one more time, would do that one more time for us so that when we are crying out, why have you forsaken me? Where are you now? Where is that help that I need so bad? Our only hope is that God would continue to act in his nature and to be gracious and merciful to us. Now we often think, we often run into the temptation that if we're abandoned, if we're we're hurting, if we're suffering, if we don't feel close to God, well, there's something we should do about it. We should pray more. We, We should try harder. We should read our Bible more. We need to do this or do that. And we we hear people telling us, here is the list of things that if you are struggling at this moment, do these things and you will be better. You will feel better. You will feel closer to God. But the reality is, if you're feeling distant from God, if, if sin has separated you, and it has, there's no amount of trying harder that's going to get you any closer to God himself. For Good Friday is where we need to be. There is nothing within us that can motivate God to return to us, to love us anymore, to come back to us, to hear our cries for help. There is nothing good within us because of that nature of sin. There is nothing we can offer to Him that He doesn't already have. That's why we need Good Friday. That's why we need Jesus. Or on Good Friday, Jesus becomes one who was forsaken for us, forsaken with us. Today is the day that we hear his cries of pain, of sorrow, and of agony over the abandonment of his Father. Surely you can remember a time when you were a child and you really needed your parent for help and you just couldn't find them. Or, or maybe even as a parent, you're out shopping and you, you look away for a second and you turn around and you can't find your child because they've just ran off around the corner. And suddenly that panic overwhelms you as, uh, where are you? And you start shouting their name, hoping to find them. That's Jesus. That's Jesus on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where are you right now? Jesus enters into our suffering. He experienced something completely foreign to him, completely new to him, in the pain and the sorrow on the cross. As suddenly the the Almighty becomes present in creation. The one who spoke to the forefathers, who brought to them deliverance from Egypt and from Assyria and Babylon, he is the one who is now crying out for help. As Jesus now speaks the same words that we do. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that's the tension of the question. The abandonment and the familiarity. My God... And yet it's now my God, not my Father. Jesus understands where we are as he becomes one of us, as he submits himself to death, even death on the cross. He didn't do anything wrong. He didn't deserve death on the cross. He didn't deserve to be forsaken like we are because of our sin. And yet he does that as today... Good Friday, we hear the cries of an innocent man who is crying out just like one who is guilty. See, Good Friday and suffering is not without purpose. The fear of David was from verse 11. Trouble is near and there's none to help. The fear is that we are abandoned and there is no support for us. The purpose of Good Friday reminds us and shows us that Jesus is present in our suffering that he is here to help, that God does not abandon us, but instead sends his own son to us, to us who are forsaken. 
And so as David writes, he calls upon God's history and invites us to remember how God saved Israel in the past. And on Good Friday, we do that same thing. We call upon God's history as we confess our sin and confess our need for Jesus. And then we call upon that history to restore us once again, to draw us back once again, to forgive us and give us that new life once again. And that's what makes Good Friday good. Remember that classic comic from BC comic strip? In the first scene, the one guy says to the second guy, I hate the term Good Friday. The second responds, why? First one says in the second, the second panel, uh, my Lord was hanged on a tree that day. To which the second one says, if you were going uh, to be hanged on it that day and he volunteered to take your place, how would you feel? Third panel, the first guy says, good. Second guy says, have a nice day. See, that's what makes today Good Friday. That Jesus was forsaken for you. That he took the place that you deserved and instead gives to you the, the glory and the righteousness and the life that he alone had. The shift occurs today as now we receive that which we are not supposed to receive because of our sin. Today is the day he makes all things new. And the psalmist recognizes that. We stopped at verse 11, but if we were to continue to read, verse 27 tells us, All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nation shall worship before you. Because God was forsaken, because Jesus was forsaken, this shift occurs. Paul says it this way in Philippians 2, that therefore God has highly exalted him, has exalted Jesus and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Before we get there, before we get to that moment of praise, we first pause and go through Good Friday to remember that in our sin we are forsaken, but that we have a Savior who was forsaken with us. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help we may cry out. And as we cry out, we see that God is near in Jesus, for he has forsaken Jesus, even though we were the ones who should have been. But that's another story for another day as we wait for Easter to come. As we remember that at that moment, we are now bound to Jesus in his death and therefore bound to him in his new life. But come back on Sunday for part three. Today, though, today we live in that tension of remembering and celebrating, and at the same time remembering and giving thanks for God has done all things for us in Jesus. We, today, we don't hide from the reality of sin. In fact, we, we confess it. We acknowledge the fact that we are forsaken. We acknowledge the fact that we struggle to find peace. And we can't find it because that forsaken nature continues to dwell within. But we also remember and celebrate. Because of Jesus, that peace has come. Because of Jesus, we have God in the flesh with us. Because of Jesus, you are no longer forsaken. Amen. And now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds together with Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.